Thank you, everyone, for coming to this session today. Um, I hope we're going to get to talk a bit about uh, augmented um, virtual productivity experiences. And um, I wanted to explain a little bit why I set up this panel. And OK, let's wait a second so you know we like, stop flowing in and out. OK. Um, so the whole idea of productivity in VR and AR and, and the way I thought of this panel is that when I, I think about productivity, I think that this is something that happens in the wild. It happens while we're on our work. And uh, you know, many people work in offices, but many people work in so many other areas. And, and all these areas, they're barely zero digital in type of or, or you know, you, you'll have a digital uh, footprint, but it's not as strong. So uh, the one thing that happens in productivity is that it happens in the wild. And the other thing is that it needs high fidelity, because we need um, time sensitive, uh, spatial sensitive type of uh, 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 systems. And OK, it's really <laughs> this flow of people, it's kind of. Um, OK. So um, the other thing is that I thought of a spatial computing and, and how virtual reality and augmented reality are part of these new uh, spatial computing devices. And I, I thought, OK, well, a spatial computing can also happen in the wild, because you can have things around you. Uh, and it also needs high fidelity. And it might be that spatial computing is actually the most optimal type of computing for productivity. So um, then I, I thought, OK, well, we're going to do productivity, and we will need devices on the wild. And for me, that looks like wearable technology. And when I look at this, I feel like the content is inside the screen. It's not around me. So this is going to change, and it's going to change with the spatial computing. So the moment you're wearing these wearables, uh, you can start having digital content around you and collaborate uh, in a very different way uh, with the content. And it's interesting because inside only one device here, you can render all the other rest. So, and, and here we have this small device that can own each of one of the other ones uh, and render them inside. Um, and that's the, it's kind of also solving a different problem, which is this challenge of society of devices that we have in productivity. So if you want to have uh, computing in all the areas that I was showing, you know, from uh, the real on the wild, you need the devices to talk to each other. And if you only have one device, it's very easy to talk between each other because you're rendering everything through this one device that it's uh, hierarchical. No? Um, so I wanted to also show a, a different uh, project because when we think of augmented and virtual reality, we're very much focused on uh, the visual perspective of it. And, um, but there are many other ways to explore reality. And I also like this one because if you think of wearing something on the wild, and uh, walking around and, for example, wearing a head-mounted display all the way from home to the bus station. You're basically blind. So uh, I like this Soundscape app because it's for blind people to navigate in the real world. It's already in four countries. A lot of people are using it. And this is what it looks for you so, uh, to go from one place to another. And I imagine if you are in a virtual reality, moving across a space, something similar could enable you to be in both realities at the same time? Sound that tells you we are pointing at building 34. OK? Yep. Now, of course, we can't walk. There's a road on the way. That's so, correct. So let's walk along the road and find a place to turn right. OK. All right, let's go. Straight on. So you can hear the beacon on your right as yep. we walk along here. So I know that I'll have to, at some point, turn right. That's right. <laughs> Marker, aim at the best stop. Good. <laughs> it says aim. So um, right there, you had a point in which it's telling you what's around you. And I, I think the, the, that's a very key challenge of spatial computing, is that um, 
you'll have a reality on top of your reality, very much like there could be a Pokemon Go just here. I just don't know about it. So all these uh, devices will need to interface with that digital content. And, and that digital content will need to also interface with the reality. And that's how you will achieve uh, a bigger um, scenarios for productivity. And I wanna go just one moment uh, back to the first display here and, and talk for a second about this because um, so once we have a spatial uh, digital content around any of these uh, scenarios, you can keep working in your real life while having the digital content. Uh, so it's not anymore about um, having um, a, a substitution or an entertainment type of perspective. We can do entertainment two hours a day. We work eight hours a day. So that's kind of how I see it. And Microsoft is doing a big effort on the first line worker, but I see how all these other aspects could be also tackled. And, and now I wanna introduce the rest of the panelists and um, uh, I think each of them will talk a bit uh, on different aspects of, of uh, the topic. Uh, we're gonna have Henry Fox talking about wearables. How can we have this wearable computing that goes with us and help us in the productivity environment? We're gonna see a bunch of projects that we have done here at Microsoft Research with the YAL, and uh, some of them are on the wild. And then we're gonna talk about the fidelity aspect. We, we need this very high fidelity in order to perform things at the level we need in a productivity setting. So uh, we're gonna have Henry first. Thank You're you. You're first? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Mar. So it's, yes, Andy. You don't like this contrast? I but I want to see the people. <laughs> I think this is good. Uh, we could Sorry. turn, yes. We could turn the lights in front off a little bit, but the lights on you, I want to keep on. So can we turn the lights <laughs> off me in front, please? Yeah, yeah, I just did. But that. I want to keep the lights on good. for people here because <laughs> I came to talk to you. The you know the visual is not that important. Okay, we're ready. <laughs> Something will happen. Let there be light, and there was light. No, no, no. So, okay, fine. It's already done. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, and it's so nice to see uh, old friends here. And since you, none of you sit in front, I'm going to come and talk to you here. Okay. Uh, what I want to talk to you about is uh, some of our work in next generation wearables. Um, this is guided by my feeling that uh, AR is going to be useful for the masses only if it gets down to the form factor of eyeglasses. So uh, I'm enthusiastic about HoloLens and some other devices that should remain unnamed. And they're good for the factory floor and for the surgeon. They're not going to be worn for a long time by masses and masses of people, in my humble opinion, until it gets down to where it's reasonably comfortable like eyeglasses. So this is all driven by that assumption that in 10 years or 20 years, we're going to get there as a community. And so what I want to talk to you about are the things that we're doing to enhance those eyeglass displays. And those eyeglass displays, we're working on putting in lots more capability in terms of cameras and IMUs, and to put in aware computing, uh, basically like digital assistants that are more aware of where you are and what you're doing, okay? So here's a familiar sort of expert consultation scenario that you have all heard about. Um, so here, this was taken in our lab uh, because we're always having trouble with our various 3D printers. And if we ever have Jim Mahaney, our lab manager, you know, get in an accident and be in a hospital, we're in big trouble. Because when things go wrong, we need him to be there. And it's not good enough to talk on the phone with him, and it's not good enough to use FaceTime because there are all kinds of delicate things that are going wrong. And so what we envision is a future time when there is 3D reconstruction, both of our lab and of his hospital room. We hope this never happens, okay? But you all understand this. Now, 
you can do this today if you have hollow quotation system. One of my favorite systems built right here. All you familiar with this? This is a fabulous system, okay? The only disadvantage is that you gotta have cameras all around the room. So you could see some of the cameras here. Uh, in their setup, it's 24 cameras in each room. So uh, eight stations in the corners and in the centers of each of these small rooms, and 24 here, and then 24 in the other guy's room. Okay, you may need more um, for certain situations, less in others, but that's a lot of cameras. It's not just that it's lots of cameras. It's that you need to have it every place where you're going to have this kind of consultation. So if the thing that went wrong in our lab was not the 3D printer, but you know that weird color printer you know, that's in the other room, well, tough, <laughs> because he can't go there from the hospital. Is that clear? So what we want to do is do this kind of a thing anywhere you go. The assumption is that everybody is wearing your special glasses. And what we're going to do is basically overload that headgear with lots of cameras. Now you say, can you afford eight cameras or 10 cameras or whatever? And my answer is yes. Not today, but 10 years from now, there'll be no trouble putting in some number of those cameras. Now, they won't all be working all the time, but they'll work whenever it is that the system needs it. So our first prototype, uh, which uh, we described in a paper last year at ISMAR, has eight cameras, uh, four of them outward looking to do 3D reconstruction on the environment and attract the user, two to look down to reconstruct the body, two to look into the face to reconstruct the eyes and the mouth. Now, it takes some amount of work to do the reconstruction of the self when you have such terrible views. Basically what happens is that you have these views looking down that you train a CNN for with some ground truth. So we have a person walking around with this headgear in a room which has, in our case, something like six or seven cameras. And then from those six or seven cameras, we get the ground truth, then we project them back onto what they would look like from the, each one of the downward looking cameras, and then we train the neural network for that. And that seems to work sort of well. Then we put it into a full pose, it's hard to tell. This is a downward looking camera because of course the pose is terrible from that downward looking camera. But you could then get it from anywhere in three space. So you have the estimated pose, then you put some anatomical constraints, then you put that into a parameterized body model, and then you have that to retarget the pre-scan that you have gotten of your user. Finally, we take the four cameras and we reconstruct the 3D environment and the user's pose using state-of-the-art structure from motion and multi-viewpoint stereo. So you get wherever the user is. Of course, the reconstruction is better nearer where the user is, and it's terrible when it's far away, but you know that's the way it works. Okay, so here is be prepared to be underwhelmed. Across the street, you can see the historic Carolina Inc. Hotel. Department members sometimes hold lunch events and meetings in its restaurants. Down the street are the expensive UNC medical facilities and hospitals. In the opposite direction, we reach the center of Chabuhu's downtown, with Franklin Street and its many shops and restaurants. Well, this is the end of our tour. Thank you for joining me. I hope you enjoy the virtual visit and are considering visiting or starting here for real. Bye bye. So you understand what was happening here. This 3D reconstruction, there's the audio, and then that is sent to some other place, which happens to be our lab. This is offline right now, and then that person can walk around that space wherever he wants. And that's why he was walking around looking at different places. Is that clear? So the other thing that I want to talk to you about is a related project of putting a personal assistant into this headgear. Now we all know about personal assistants because I use mine all the time. You know, it says 
two and a half billion commands were done by these kinds of personal assistants. Of course, 80% of them were set the alarm for 15 minutes, <laughs> right? But now, if you put your personal assistant inside your headgear, it has a possibility of knowing the space around you because it has access to all this vision uh, information, and it knows something about your user state. It knows where you're walking, it knows what you stopped, it knows you're looking away, and we could also then put it into the space visually. And we think that's a big win because then that personal assistant, in contrast to Alexa and Siri and all the others, could then motion things to you. Like, if you say, uh, where is you know, the reading room on this floor? I know it's somewhere. It will say, follow me, you know, it's over here. So here's Could you one turn of those. me to Henry's office? We will turn left at Robotics I Lab and then turn right Henry's at Conference office. Room, follow me. That was in order to make me feel good. <laughs> this is Hyung Hoon Kim's work. Turn left here. Okay. Now, in fact, turned left earlier. There he is. And this is, notice, it's sort of walking and... Would you like to continue to Henry? Yes. So you see, it knew somehow. We will that turn right at conference away. room. Follow me. All right. Do we have to wait until it gets to my office? All right. It's only a couple more seconds. Those of you who've been to Chapel Hill, uh, no, <laughs> just around the corner. Now, presumably. You Turn right here. Questions. We have arrived. Would you like to go somewhere else? No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, young who knows how to end a demo. So, let me mention one more thing before my time is up. The displays need to be a lot better if we're going to be wearing these things all day. And that is, if you talk to people who are doing content uh, for example, filmmakers who make content, they will say without your prompting, they're making it 15 minutes. And they say, why only 15 minutes? They said, after that, people sort of get queasy. Well, why do they get queasy? It's because of a lot of different factors. But latency happens to be one of them. And the other is that you're not putting the image of the virtual objects at the appropriate depth. When I'm holding that teapot at 20 centimeters, that teapot appears to me at one meter or one and a half meters, and that causes strain, not for the first minute, but if I had to do that for a long time. Or that house, that's virtual house across the street, should be at 50 meters, but it's really at one and a half meters also. Okay? So we're, and so here is a concept drawing. So here, you're looking at a physical guidebook and you're looking at real buildings, and you want to have annotation both on the guidebook saying, oh, this is where I marked before that this is an interesting place to go. And by the way, that happens to be down the street here on the left. You want the annotation to be close, and you want the annotation on the building to be far away. Okay? So this is really difficult, not just from an optical standpoint, but it's really difficult for older people like me because I can't adjust my focus very well, so I need to change my glasses from near to far away. Well, if you have all this capability in your machine, you might as well give it your prescription, and then it knows that, you know, I, without my glasses, see only far, and I need reading glasses then. So it needs to then correct the internal display to be thrown at the appropriate place, like seven meters, and it could also maybe, if we have a tunable lens in front, it could also correct what I'm looking at in the real world. So when I'm looking at the guidebook, it will focus at the guidebook, and when you're looking far away, uh, it will correct for far away. So here is one very small representation. So this is just our lab here in which somebody's bicycles there at, I don't know, four meters. And then there's uh, Andy Van Dam's book, if you recognize the computer graphics textbook. And that's at whatever it is, you know, a half meter away. And then there's a little stamp that's like at 20 centimeters away. And now this person here, Leonard McMillan, tells me he could see without his glasses at seven meters. 
So none of this stuff is in focus. But then when, we, when he tells us what I'm looking at now is half meter away, we adjust the tunable lens here so that it throws things that are half a meter at seven meters, so he could see that in focus. And we further adjust a deformable transparent membrane here so that this display screen, which is at like 10 centimeters, it throws that to seven meters away. Is that clear? Okay, so that's limited by the amount of time that I have. But oh, the thing I wanted to mention to you is, now you get, it says here, eyeglasses that are useful for you even if you never turn augmentation on. Right? Because now I may not need to switch between the far glasses and reading glasses. It says here, it has all these cameras. It could tell what I'm looking at. It is tracking my eyes. I'm looking at the thing here. It focuses there. I'm looking at Andy. It focuses on Andy. So you have all this sensing and computing capability. You might as well use it independent of any augmentation. Is that clear? That's what we think will get people, that's what I personally think will get people to wear these because even if you don't do any augmented reality, it will help you in your daily life, okay? So there's another one here in physical therapy, we're starting to work with people because look, if it records what you're doing in the physical therapist's office and then the physical therapist says, go do this in the morning and at night for 10 minutes, then it's recording it when you're doing it the next morning. And since we're getting the joint angles anyway, when it's out of bounds, it will say, you're not quite doing it right. <laughs> How does it know that? Well, it measured the joint angles when you were in the physical therapist's office. And when it says you're not doing it right, it plays it back for you. So it says, you see, right here, you bent your arms more now than you did yesterday. OK? So in summary, I think my time is about up. Is that right? So in summary, there's lots of possibilities. You know, once we get the form factor into eyeglasses, there's lots of technologies that we could bring to bear, and there's lots of applications. These are just three of a myriad of applications. You know, it's like, what do you use your cell phone for? Calling is the least important thing, all right? But here's what I think is the biggest problem. I hate to be a Cassandra, is that the right thing? Privacy, okay? I think this is the showstopper. None of the technologies is a showstopper. This is a showstopper. Why? Because you know this is going to get a lot of personal information. You know, if you think that your life is not private now, think about what it would be. You're having all of this recording, everything, all the movements that you make, okay? All your daily activities, who do you see, what we see, what we do. This is the worst of Big Brother, okay? Now, in fact, there are technological solutions to this. We could have, for example, a private server. We have end-to-end -end encryption. We have 128-bit public key encryption. It's pretty hard to break. But you know what? The problem is twofold. One is, the in my view, this is all my view. Is it clear? <laughs> None of my collaborators. This is my view. Consumers are not educated, OK? They think, oh, it's great. You know, I will get. 15% off my grocery bill, or 5% off, if I just sign up for a VIP customer. And by the way, I want to share, you know, I want to synchronize um, all my data from my phone to my laptops and all everything, OK? That's going through all some public servers, OK? Not public servers, it's some company servers. And the commercial entities and authorities want access. Commercial entities because that's how they make their money, right? And authorities will say, oh, we need that so that the bad guys, you know, who want to do illegal things, you know, we could, you know, catch them. Or the terrorists, you know, we want to be able to capture them. So as a result, it's not at all clear to me that we'll be able to solve the privacy issue. So here's my one slide conclusion, 11 out of 11, okay? Oh shit, I hate that, okay? There's a lot of promise here. The problem is, I don't know if we could solve the privacy issues, but if we can, there's lots of great things we could do. Thank you. Um. So we're ready. Awesome. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, please, Ayal. Yeah, can you hear me? Good. That was a good decision to be sick, and now it's much quieter outside. OK, so uh, 
Mara asked me to talk about uh, AR and VR at work. And uh, I'll try to give a bit of a hint of what we're thinking and uh, trying to get. Uh, and we would like to have a future where we coming in the morning to uh, work, putting on uh, some uh, near eye display and enabling to do things that we couldn't do before. But uh, if I look currently at how people use uh, HMDs, it's mostly looked like this. I'm coming in, I'm putting on a uh, display, I'm uh, using it for 15 minutes and then take it off and probably continue uh, working as usual. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, there's uh, obviously uh, a blame for the quality of uh, our current displays, their weight, their uh, resolution, focus, uh, battery power, and so on. Uh, but uh, I actually come here to talk about the application and the software and say these are also have limitations because they are very uh, designed for uh, very specific uses, specific locations. And if I want that the display will be useful for me throughout the day, I need to be uh, very flexible in answering uh, uh, the needs. So we start to look at the value proposition of using uh, virtual reality uh, and augmented reality, but let me focus first on virtual reality, which seems to be further away from work. So why would it be better to work in uh, virtual reality where I actually don't see uh, the environment around me? So um, let's start with our workstation. Most people uh, sit next to a table and work uh, with a computer. Not very healthy, but very uh, low energetic uh, gesture that enables me to uh, sit down and uh, work for eight hours. Uh, and the first thing most people use is uh, the mouse and keyboard. So we looked at uh, this ability. Can VR let us take this environment with us? So wherever I go, I could put on a headset and I have my office around me and I could uh, work like I used to, uh, would I be able to uh, a use Office the same way in VR? So if I look at keyboards, which are the most common way that people know how to uh, enter text, whether these are physical keyboards that give us uh, haptic feedback or touch keyboards that you can find on tablets, can we use them in VR? Um, which wasn't immediately clear how to uh, uh, use that, but uh, nowadays as we see the technology progress, we see more and more uh, devices that enable us, for example, uh, a capacitive sensing keyboards or uh, tracking, visually tracking the hands that enable us to see both the keyboard as well as our hands. And how good are we in typing that? So in we look at different ways speaker, that we, we can the use that, whether it's and uh, looking down at the keyboard where it is, or using virtual the fact reality that, uh, head mounted display has a number of characteristics of which make typing in virtual reality harder. For example, the vertical the field of view is typically limited relative to a natural field of view. Okay, and disconnect us from reality and say the keyboard and our hands are not where they are, but they wherever I'm looking at. So this way I can disconnect, uh, I myself not a touch typist, though I can see uh, uh, the way that I type wherever I'm looking at the uh, document. Also, why do we need to see our hands? Maybe there's other way representation that enable us to work better. So we tried on different ways that we can uh, represent our hands from not rendering our hands at all, just what keys are being uh, pressed to, uh, yeah, okay. So that's what you see there on the corner to uh, getting a, just a video feed of what we do, which is supposed to be the closest we can have for uh, real life, but still wearing an HMD, to uh, modeling the motions that we do of the hands as a 3D object. And uh, finally, just the tip of our uh, fingers uh, touching the keyboards. By the way, any idea which one is the best? Do people know? What would you say? 
Okay, so what we saw was when we looked at the quality, the, the, the speed, the errors, the uh, preference of people, what was surprised to us was that people actually like very minimalistic uh, approach, like the tip of the fingers, while a very complete representation like 3D hands were not that good. Um, even small differences between what the, the 3D hands are doing and what we do generate some kind of uh, uh, uncanny valley which reduces our uh, speed. Um, then we look at, at the, the computer, for example, the keyboard. Nobody says that the keyboard had to uh, look like it uh, looks today when we uh, can change the environment around us. So maybe we can generate additional value in VR by uh, changing how the keyboard is. For example, uh, I could change the language easily, or if I need to add additional contextual characters, like putting an umlaut in Germany, uh, when I uh, press a button, I can immediately show options around it that we can uh, use. Uh, we can have shortcuts without uh, learning where they are or use the window manager instead of Alt-Tab, uh, jump directly to uh, the application uh, on the keyboard. And basically what we can do is we can look at the keyboard in uh, two dimensions. One is what is the functionality that we're getting? Are we pressing one button and getting one functionality? Or maybe we can press a group of buttons or maybe even have a mapping like a touch uh, surface that we, whatever we touch in the keyboard, it will have a different functionality. And also how we represent the keyboard visually to people, whether it is we're changing a single button or changing the geometry, for example, unifying three buttons to one big one, or even uh, uh, do things such as sliders, or in this case, uh, we enable people to put in password privately by uh, having a private shuffling inside the VR while people see you type and cannot uh, recover the password. And here's another example where we use uh, the keyboard as a touch surface just for gaming. So wherever the hammer hits the keyboard, we, uh, we know whether we hit that whack-a-mole. And here's an example where uh, a person can actually, uh, I don't know if you Okay, can actually t uh, uh, input uh, a continuous position along a video, and if you, for example, press two buttons, it gets an intermediate position. So that was about our workstation, but we're not just sitting in the workstation, we're going to a meeting, we're going around the office, and uh, we wanted to see if we can actually uh, make the application be flexible enough to deal with the environment around us. Sometimes I, I go to a big room like this, sometimes I maybe sit in a small room, um, and application should be uh, uh, flexible to deal with that, and we did uh, that mostly in AR. Nowadays we are expanding also to uh, VR of looking at around the environment and then giving some rules from the designer, we can uh, change the application to fit that specific uh, room. For example, here is a game of uh, uh, a speed racer where uh, the track is different between different rooms because the geometry is different, but uh, difficulty of the game and other uh, aspects that we needed from the application is the same. And uh, by the way, I, f I wish I heard your talk before because I would give another page that we did something specifically that for the privacy, where uh, there's a lot of things that we learn on the fly in the device, but we don't send the information back. What we actually send is multiple options toward the uh, device and the device decide what to do according to that. Um, and nowadays, uh, for example, products like Unity are following uh, uh, things such as Flare to uh, incorporate that into uh, application for uh, uh, augmented reality. Now, let, I'm almost running out of time, so I'll just go for the total wild. What if I want to right now wear the head up display and just start walking around the building, walking outside. And you might ask, why would I do that? I'm already in virtual reality and I don't care where I am. Um, so there's uh, different motivations for uh, 
doing that. For example, think of, uh, I right now want to uh, visit a remote site. I put on a VR headset and suddenly I'm at the remote site and people over there grant, uh, uh, walk with me. They may be using uh, an AR display to see me in their uh, lab or site. And as I walk, I want to be able not to hit any people around here or chair or table, uh, but still feel like I'm over there. Can I do that? It's a bit weird. It's, uh, uh, if you can imagine someone walking in the corridors with a Bluetooth earpiece talking to unknown person on the phone, this is someone walking through the corridors with eyes blocked and talking and interacting with people that we don't see. But uh, it's sort of the same uh, kind of uh, uh, semantics. Uh, and obviously games, I could uh, suppose I want to do a multi-user games on a large environment and unfortunately I don't own an arena. Uh, can I uh, be able to do that in the real environment and still not endanger myself? Or maybe I want to go for tourism. And again, this is really weird. I already go to an archeological site and I put a VR and block myself from it. Why would I do that? Um, because I'm coming with other people and I can hear, I can smell, I can test all around, but suddenly the people, the, the tourists are wearing togas and the cars are chariots and I feel like I'm in that period and whenever I take off the HMD, I'm back uh, in current time. So we have several systems that we built. One of them is uh, called vRomer, uh, which the idea was how can we uh, a, uh, play a game that will be on, not on my slide. Okay, that's interesting. Let me just, where is that? Okay, so do I have it here? Um, bear with me one second. Is all right, so let me take it. Do we go to this? Yes. Okay, so suppose someone wants to play a game in a big environment and let me, and I don't hear myself either. Okay, so someone is walking in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a game and he's actually in an environment full of people and he needs to be uh, walking there and still be safe. So how can we do that? We have a script that we have to follow, which is in the game. Uh, we cannot invent that on the fly. And on the other hand, this environment could change all the time. Someone might bring in a cart and block my way or open a door or close a door. So what we do, we actually look at the event or the experience as a graph. We have nodes that we need to go through to uh, complete a story. And while each node by itself is uh, well-defined, we give springs between those nodes, and those springs are paths that we generate on the fly as we walk around an environment. So I'm putting on a headset, I'm in a dungeon, I'm walking around, I need to go and find the treasure. If suddenly the, my way is blocked, then I can see some event happening and a door opens here, or maybe a, a, a pile of rocks falls here and blocks my way. And eventually when I see that there is enough space to do a node that I need to render, then suddenly I see uh, a house that I can go in and take the treasure and so on. And so we had people walking around our building, walking around the campus, uh, trying to do that. And I'm, it's a bit weird that I don't have the video. I hope I'll find it by the end. <laughs> I don't want to take too much time. Okay. Thank you, Jan. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Of, um, I want to highlight two things from Eyal's talk uh, just now. And uh, one is, um, you know, there multiple ways we can be smart about the privacy issue that Henry was talking about before. And, and the other one is um, that 
using the inside out tracking systems and cameras that are looking outside, we can start having object avoidance and people actually walking through a building inside another setup, either via game or uh, any other type of um, content. Okay, so let me just one second. Um, introduce the next uh, speaker. So uh, we are now going to move into the part of the session in which we focus about fidelity. Because uh, we've seen uh, devices by uh, Henry Fox, uh, we've seen all these different applications uh, from AYAL and how this moves into the wild, really like walking down the street. What does it feel? How can you avoid some people that might come into you or obst obstacles? Uh, but the, what will make this safe for you to do that is the level of fidelity in which you achieve in, inside the virtual environments and also for productivity because you need this critical accuracy for things. So uh, I want to invite Sarah Kremrer uh, from uh, University of Utah to um, uh, provide her uh, view on fidelity for VR and productivity. Thank you. Yes, can does that you can hear me okay? So far. Okay, great. Okay, found the video. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, uh, um, as Mark said, I, I, I'm Sarah Creamer Gear. I am a um, psychology professor at the University of Utah, and my area of study is in visual perception and spatial cognition. And um, I've been studying the, these topics in both real and virtual environments for a number of years. Um, for me, when I think about the use of virtual and augmented reality for spatial cognition, I think of, of VR and AR as both an opportunity and as a challenge. And the opportunity is that with virtual environments, especially immersive virtual environments, we can manipulate um, environment-based and body-based cues in ways that are really difficult or sometimes impossible to do in the real world. But at the same time, we can maintain ecological validity while we have people um, perceiving and acting in realistic immersive spaces where they can interact as if it were the real world. So ideally, this balance of control um, in experimental paradigms and realism could help us to, to really make progress in understanding the basic mechanisms understanding um, spatial cognition, how we understand spaces around us. Uh, but the challenge is that we would argue that the utility of virtual environments increases um, for research and for applications with the likelihood that people will perceive and act in the virtual space in the same way that they will act in the real world. Okay, so we call this concept perceptual fidelity. How closely can we match people's actions in the virtual space to the real space? Okay, and if they're matched closely, then we can think that we have some high level of perceptual fidelity. So one of the challenges that we faced in the study of virtual environments over a number of years is this pervasive finding that virtual spaces seem to be perceived as smaller than what's intended. So they're perceived as kind of, these spaces are perceived as compressed, even when the virtual spaces are matched exactly in geometry to the real world. Okay, so this could be a problem uh, for both research and applications um, that rely on perception of absolute scale. Okay, so perceiving absolute size and distance is critical for many applications such as um, architectural design or um, training and simulation or even um, navigation kind of um, uh, assistance. So um, I have taken a real interdisciplinary approach to the study of perceptual fidelity with my colleagues in computer science at Utah and at Vanderbilt and other places where we come at it from um, kind of a dual perspective in that we're trying to address this applied problem 
of creating virtual spaces that are as effective as they can be, right, so that people will act in them as if they were in the real world. But in doing this research, we've also gained a lot of insights into the mechanisms um, that underlie uh, visual space perception and spatial cognition, such as, um, for example, we've, we've looked at the influence of feedback as you move through a space and how that leads to visual motor calibration or changing um, this relationship between perception and action. And we've looked at the role of the visual body in scaling space by putting avatars into spaces. So how do we measure the perception of uh, the scale of the environment that people perceive? Well, what we've argued is that there are many ways to do this, and you can ask people about how big things look and kind of how much they feel um, present in the environment. But what we think is a strong measure is to look at people's actions, okay? So we've looked at um, the measurement of perceptual fidelity in terms of action. And one example is using a task that we call blind walking that's been shown um, uh, in many, over decades in the real world um, to be a really good, um, valid measure of distance perception. So in this uh, type of task, it's called a visually directed action, where you may look at a target in, an, in the environment, close your eyes and walk the distance to that target. Okay, so um, what we know is that people are very good at doing this in the real world, up to maybe about 20 or, more, 20 or so meters. Um, and the idea is that we're very good at dynamically updating our position in space as we move. The other measure that I'll talk about in more detail is a measure of perceived affordances. So this is a question that we ask an observer, is it possible to act on the space? Okay, so this is just an example here showing um, if you're presented with an aperture um, that you could possibly pass through, you make a decision, is it possible to pass through, to pass through that um, based on your own body dimensions? Okay, so we can use these, both these types of action-based measures to make comparisons between what people do in the virtual world and what people do in real world spaces to get a sense of the level of perceptual fidelity. So here's just an example of some, um, some work that we and many others have done on distance perception in virtual environments. Um, where typically using this measure of blind walking, which we know that people are um, close to accurate at doing in the real world, um, on average across many different studies in virtual environments, we've found that people underestimate the distance um, by walking. Okay, so they'll walk about 70% um, uh, of the actual distance. And this has been shown in many different studies. But the reason I also bring this up is to say that some of the challenges that we've, we experience may change with changing technologies. So this is a study that we did a couple years ago that compared um, the same exact task, the same exact virtual environment, but with two di different head-mounted displays. So the first one I showed you is the, the traditional Envis um, HMD that we had used for many years and found about you know that people are uh, showing uh, about 70 percent accuracy, and then when we compare that to people doing this judgment wearing, this was the Oculus DK2 a couple years ago, um, we see that people are more accurate. Now they're walking about 90 percent of the distance. And this now has been replicated by a number of different labs with a number of different um, of the new commodity level head mounted displays. So some of this distance compression that we saw for maybe, you know, 10 or more years with the old technologies seems to be going away a little bit. Okay, so we need to kind of adapt our questions and challenges to these new technologies. So this brings me to thinking about augmented reality. So we've become interested in measuring the perceptual fidelity of AR in the similar way that we've looked at um, doing these measurements in VR. So in augmented reality, again, we may face different challenges and different opportunities, because here's a case where now people are in a real world environment um, um, and they're experiencing the real world, but now we superimpose graphics over that world and we want to ask the question, similarly, do people perceive spatial locations, distances, sizes in the same way in AR as they would do if they had completely real world? So to do this, we've been using this measure of perceived affordances. And as I mentioned before, this is the idea of asking people about judgments for their action capabilities. Now, these, this idea of affordances came from J.J. Uh, Gibson. 
um, in his last book in 1979, where he defined affordances as the action possibilities in an environment which are directly related to an observer's um, capabilities. Okay, so it's the idea with affordances is it's not just what's in the environment, but you're making a decision of those features in the environment with respect to your own body, your own body dimensions, your own body capabilities. So back to the doorway, that doorway is passable um, only if it's wider than the widest part of your body. Okay, so otherwise you're gonna bump your shoulders when you walk into that aperture unless you turn your body. Okay, so we can ask about affordances in many different types of actions, passing through, you could ask affordance about, about within reaching or grasping space, so an apple may be graspable only if it fits within the span of your hand. Okay, so we're relating the environment to your own body, and we can do this both within the virtual environment and the real world, and make direct comparisons. So this is what we did in a series of studies, and we're still continuing these with different types of affordances and different questions. But um, one thing we were interested in is to test different affordances that rely on different body dimensions and capabilities, as well as different regions of space or different scales of distances. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about just quickly a study that looked at passing through, which I've mentioned before. So this is looking at an aperture that's you know, a number of meters away from you. And then another type of affordance, which is stepping over a gap. Okay, so this is now a different type of action, but it's also a different region of space. This is a space that's right at your body. Okay, so we wanna see if people, um, how people judge affordances in AR when we have these differences, and whether this might interact with some of the, um, the, the features of the technology we're using the HoloLens here. So, just to give you a little bit more about the method of using affordances, here's an example. So we have one of our graduate students, Grant, whose uh, picture is on the top um, image, and he's wearing the HoloLens. And then you see on the bottom, bottom, bottom image what, he's, what he is seeing. So there's two virtual poles, and these poles can be presented at different distances away from him and at different widths. Okay, so on every trial, he needs to look at the width between those two poles and decide whether yes or no, he answers, can I pass through or not? Okay, and so then what we do is we, we have a whole set of trials that have these AR poles, and then we have a whole another set of trials that have real world poles, and the person is always standing in the same real world lab. Okay, so everything's kind of controlled, except the, um, the only difference is whether they're seeing AR objects or real world objects. And um, we get these yes or no responses, and then we take the point at which the person switches from saying yes, I could pass through, to no, I could not, okay? And that's their crossover point. And we um, scale that, we may take a ratio of that to their actual shoulder width, okay? So we can say, um, are they making these judgments relative you know, to their own um, body size? Um, and then also in this study, we had people walk using the blind walking measure to the distance to the poles, because we were interested to see their distance perception in, in this AR context as well. Okay, so the take home message is that we saw very similar performance with real world poles and AR poles. So there's no significant difference here. Um, green bars are the AR, gray bars are the real world, both in the blind walking task, which is just presented as a, the ratio of distance walk to the actual distance, and they're passing through judgment, which is their crossover point um, in relation to their own actual passing through. Okay, so this is good news that we find that using the HoloLens, people are actually able to judge affordances to virtual objects in the same way that they judge affordances to um, real objects. But the story actually changed a little bit for our next affordance judgment. So this is now stepping over a gap, and you can see in these, um, images, uh, people either have a real piece of material that's at different gap widths right at their feet, or here's our observer looking down at her feet and seeing um, the virtual gap. Okay, so again, similar on every trial, the gap changes in width, and the person just has to say, could I step over that gap, um, taking the largest step that is possible without running or jumping or without moving their back foot off of the ground. And we take that crossover point again when they say, yes, I could step over the gap, 
to no, I could not, um, and divide that by their actual largest step. Okay, so we get a ratio, again, to what they could actually do, and we're directly comparing what they do with a real-world stimulus versus the AR gap. Okay, so then in this case, we found that people underestimated their capability in AR compared to the real world. So we know from other studies we've done and what's in the literature and affordances that people tend to overestimate their capability to step over a gap in the real world. So what we're, what we're interested in is not so much the absolute accuracy, but how does their accuracy compare to the real world? Okay, so the real world's are standard, and in AR, they're underestimating. The question is why? Um, we have some thoughts about this that relate to the limitations of the field of view in the HoloLens. So when you think about it, if something's farther away, um, that AR, uh, more of that AR object is gonna fit within the field of view. But here in the gap, which is right at their feet, um, and you look down and you have a pretty narrow field of view, both vertical and horizontal um, field, field of view in the HoloLens, then you only see a very small portion of that graphics like in every kind of view that you take. So what people have to do is really rotate their head and integrate these different pieces of the virtual gap together. And it could be that that makes them perceive that it's bigger and that they're less capable of stepping over um, a larger gap. So, um, so it's possible that um, the perceptual fidelity of um, AR in terms of affordances is influenced by the space of the action that we are talking about. And that, again, interacts with potentially the technology, that if we had a wider field of view, maybe we wouldn't see the limitation in the near space. Um, it's also very likely that the properties of the AR object matter, such as um, uh, its shape, its texture. One of the things that um, Bobby's gonna talk a, a little bit more about is the importance of shadows and the importance of um, being able to perceive that target as grounded, as really attached to the ground. Um, so there are many different factors in, involved in, likely involved in this perceptual fidelity of AR objects um, that we still need to continue to explore. So to conclude, um, what I would argue is that we can think about mediated environments uh, on a continuum from completely real world to AR objects to completely virtual world um, as having the potential to advance spatial, spatial research and applications. Um, but in order to do that, it's really important to evaluate perceptual fidelity in terms of what humans um, can do, in terms of how people actually act and compare that performance um, to the real world and use the real world as a standard. Um, what we've been seeing is that there's more flexibility in AR um, environments uh, where we can still have the real world but add augmented um, stimuli and features into the environment, but also challenges for the perception of realism of those augmented reality objects. And um, Bobby Bodenheimer will um, expand on that a little bit more in some of the research that we're doing together. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, very interesting to start thinking about, okay, we can be on productivity, but how good do we need to be and, uh, and what type of um, sort of errors uh, will this generate? Our next speaker is Bobby Bodenheimer from uh, Vanderbilt. And <coughs> Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, there we go. And great. Yeah, I'm Bobby Bodenheimer from Vanderbilt University, and I work closely with Sarah, as she said. So I'm, my talk is somewhat of a continuation of hers. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges we face in trying to get high perceptual fidelity in the augmented reality. So uh, just to recap, although I don't think we need to do much of that, uh, just what perceptual fidelity is, is we want our interactions with our augmented reality objects to match interactions with real world objects. If they do that, we would say we have high perceptual fidelity. If they don't, we would have low perceptual fidelity. This is a concept that has been developed in virtual reality. Uh, and it's typically studied with affordances, as Sarah was talking about. So here, 
You have the, the passing through affordance that she talked about. People are passing through in the real world. The poles are going to get closer together. At some point, they would go single file, or they would bend to face each other and become narrower. If you do that with ver um, sorry, if you do that with um, avatars, you would want those crossover points to be the same. All right. So that's the concept of perceptual fidelity. Again, to recap in a nutshell, and um, I am going to limit. There are many ways of doing augmented reality, right? There are many different display modalities for augmented reality. You can have tablet augmented reality. You can have a number of different devices. And people work on different devices. Some of those people are in this room. I'm going to limit my discussion of augmented reality to optical see-through head-mounted displays, like the HoloLens, like the Magic Leap, OK? And so I'm going to talk about the challenges associated with those specific devices, those devices that are available to the consumer today, OK? So I think that if you had different devices, like tablet-based augmented reality, you would have different challenges for getting perceptual fidelity through those devices. And it would be a, sort of a whole different ball game. But I think the challenges with those devices, uh, the HoloLens and so on, are going to be challenges associated with brightness, transparency of the augmented reality objects, limited field of view, and the ability that the rendering engine can only add light to the scene. Okay? And we'll see how that is, affected, is affecting perceptual fidelity. I want to talk about three specific examples in my remaining remarks. All right? So those are uh, perception of depth and gaps, continuing on, uh, sort of continuing on with what Sarah said. Uh, and so let's consider an example from VR. So the perception of depth. Anyone who's done VR for any uh, amount of time knows that when you are pre presented with depth in VR, presented with the illusion that you're at height, that becomes a very compelling experience. Here's a classic example of this from the University of North Carolina uh, of a pit room. And when you're presented like standing right here looking down, your heart rate increases, you begin to break out in sweat, uh, and, and so on, because you're afraid you're going to fall, even though you're standing on a flat floor like this. Okay? Or maybe, as they did at North Carolina, you, you're standing on a slightly raised elevation where you can just feel like there's a little ridge right there. That enhances the illusion. But it's not completely necessary to get that. Okay? And this is a classic pit room, classic paper, explaining these effects. Okay, and everyone who does VR demos has one of these in their little library that they pull out when high school students come through. This is ours, okay? Uh, and uh, there's a gap in the middle there, and you get really great effects when people try to walk out through there. Their balance is affected and everything. And we've done affordance studies in these environments, and we've shown that if you want behavior to match what they do, uh, stepping off of heights in the real world, like stepping off of this table, maybe a little lower, stepping off of that chair, you need to have people um, endowed with a full body self avatar. And then the fidelity of the virtual environment matches that of the real world very well. Okay, so you have high perceptual fidelity. And if you don't have a full body self avatar, everything is out of whack. Okay? So those are examples of, from virtual reality of getting high perceptual fidelity and having uh, good uh, perception of depth and so on. Now let's think about the case with augmented reality. You can create an illusion of depth in the floor with augmented reality. This is an example of doing it in the hollow lens. Um, and people will, you, you can create this illusion, and it does look like there's a a pit in the floor. And we've done studies here to show that people's behavior will be affected by this, but it's not going to be as compelling as in virtual reality. Okay? Nobody is going to break out in a sweat. Nobody's going to be terrified of falling in the pit here. So what we can show is that people's gap judgment in the sense of what Sarah was talking about their ability to judge whether they would step across a pit of various widths there 
is affected by the depth of the gap. And let me give you an example. So this is what it looks like, more or less. It doesn't look quite this good in the real world through the hollow lens. But that's, that's sort of what that depth looks like in the, the hollow lens. And you can see there's a little bit of transparency there and so on. Um, and this is just going to replay. So I'll let you see it one more time. Um, and that's one and a half meters deep. Uh, so what you can see here is, is it compared to the, to the step that they would take normally in the real world, uh, the, the uh, depth of the pit is affecting what their judgment is. But, and the deeper the pit goes, the more it's affecting it. But it's not a compelling illusion. So this has, we have some fidelity in augmented reality, but it's not a great amount of fidelity, I would say. Uh, and this is because the, the, you can see the floor through the illusion, you can tell you have this limited field of view. You have to sort of space things together. So there are limits, because of the current technology, to producing a true high fidelity illusion in augmented reality here. The second example I want to talk about is shadows. It's been known for a long time that shadows are essential cues to getting the 3D position and shape of objects. Da Vinci knew that. Everybody's known it since then. And there's been a lot of work on rendering algorithms and computer graphics put to getting shadows correct. Okay? Um, but let's think about shadows in augmented reality with these technologies are hard. Oh, and here's an example, right? I forgot about this. This is an example. So these cubes are in the same place, uh, but obviously the shadow is, pin is showing you that it's pinned to the floor. So when you put a shadow in, in the example, it becomes pinned to the, to the plane there, and it becomes perceptually obvious that it's pinned to the plane. And there are other cues that you could put in the uh, scene, like inner reflections and so on, that would perceptually pin it as well or better. But I'm just concentrating on shadows here. All right. So rendering shadows in AR is more difficult because we can only add light to the scene. And here's an example of how we're doing it. We did not invent this technique. We sort of came up with it, but other people invented it. And if you try to figure out who invented it first, you, you get into a morass of problems. So I don't actually know who thought of this technique first. It's kind of one of those things like the blend line clipping algorithm it was sort of presented first, and he was the first that wrote about it. But I don't even know who the first person to write about it was. A lot of people thought about it, perhaps. What you do is you render a gray shadow mask here, and then you put a light penumbra around it so that your visual system enhances the contrast here and makes it look like a shadow. Okay, And that's sort of the best you can do in the HoloLens. And this is the way we do these images in my lab to, convince, to remind ourselves that we're seeing them through the HoloLens as we leave the cursor in the hollow lens on there. So this is through the hollow lens. And you can see that this looks OK, but you can see the contour of the penumbra out there. And the problem with this is that it's affected by the uh, texture of the underlying surface. So this was done on a wooden surface. If we change the surface to a tablecloth, a checkered tablecloth, then the penumbra goes away to some extent, but the transparency issue of the cube comes through. And uh, you, can, you can see that we're getting placement information. So in this case, the image on the right, the cube is actually above the tablecloth, and the shadow is giving you that information, but it doesn't look great. Okay? So shadows are a real problem with current technology because of this ability to only add light to the scene. And um, obviously, the transparency is, is causing us problems just because of the way we don't have enough brightness and, and so on in our, in our displays. And then the third and final thing that I want to talk about just very briefly is passability. Sarah talked about passability. I want to consider a slightly more realistic example of passability and talk about it in the context of the narrow field of view of 
our current AR devices. Uh, here's an example of two walls, and your, your, your um, task perhaps is to judge whether you can go through them and then to walk through them. Uh, and this looks pretty good. I mean, these are AR walls. You can tell they're AR walls because you can see the, um, you can see the wall behind them, the real world wall behind them. Now the problem here is, is that this view is from a specific perspective in the real world. And you make this view and then you start walking towards the walls, the AR walls, and all of a sudden something unexpected will happen. They will go out of view of the eye box of the HoloLens and they will disappear. Because now the field of view is, they're outside of the field of view of where you can render graphics. And that's very unexpected to the naive user. And what does the naive user do? They stop and they look around, right? So does it change their behavior? Well, this is something we're currently looking at. I don't know the answer to that. And then they can walk up to where the AR walls are and they can look and, oh, there's a wall there and, oh, there's a wall there. But what do they do about that? And that's not the way that real world walls behave. They don't suddenly disappear and then you go up and suddenly they're there or not. So this is a real problem for us in terms of the, um, the field of view in, in sort of act, um, uh, in sort of affordances where we're actually acting out the affordance judgment instead of just making a clear, a, a passive judgment about it, okay? And so this is where the, the field of view of the HoloLens is, is, is a problem. And so uh, the takeaway messages that I would like you to take home from this talk are that the state of the art in optical see-through augmented reality displays is improving, uh, and it's improving rapidly. And people in this room are working on that. But having said that, many of the problems for high perceptual fidelity are difficult. And it's difficult to foresee that um, those problems are going to be fixed, certainly at the consumer level, in the near future. And so what we're going to be faced with and what I work on is uh, fixing and creating software enhancements, software tricks to m leverage perception to raise, sometimes artificially, the perceptual fidelity of our AR environments uh, so that we can get away with doing what we want to do and convincing you that augmented reality is real. And figuring out what those software enhancements is, is um, challenging. All right. And so that's my talk. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we can have now the uh, panelists come over here. Um, if you prefer to have a smaller chairs, we can also have a smaller chairs. Yeah, it's true. Good. Um, yeah, this was very interesting, uh, Bobby. I think. Um, um, of course, to go into production or uh, the productivity uh, challenge in inside the virtual reality, um, I, I think it should be fine. <laughs> it's okay if we don't have, you know, it, it, let's, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll put the Q&A. Um, okay, so uh, if somebody has questions, uh, we are going to have a, a mic over there. And um, so I think there are a few things that I want to summarize about this uh, couple of talks. One is um, we're talking about wearable devices. They have challenges uh, both in privacy and in fidelity that we need to address in order to achieve uh, productive uh, scenarios and applications. And um, <coughs> Uh, I, I feel many of these challenges are opportunities uh, for both hardware creation and, and software creation, and I think that can maybe start the discussion. I, I think there was a hand over there, no? Yeah, good, we got a winner.
So I'm, I'm just gonna put on the background this uh, slide with the, the productivity uh, examples. Hi, Evan Suma from the University of Minnesota. I'd like to start with a somewhat pessimistic question. Um, given the, the interesting results of, uh, that Sarah showed about the distance estimation being less compressed with modern head-mounted displays, I'm wondering how suspicious do we need to be about like the 30 years worth of perceptual and cognitive studies and empirical results that we have in the VR community with old technology? Is there a need to now to replicate every, all the work that's been done? And following up on that, uh, what does it mean for researchers who are doing that type of perceptual work when there's, uh, now that the pace of technological advancement is much faster, uh, a new higher field of view, lower latency display could come out the next year and then suddenly render all those studies and phenomena that you're looking at, oh, never mind, it's no longer a problem anymore. Okay, um, I think I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, in fact, uh, this is very interesting because I, I recently uh, reviewed this paper uh, that it's gonna be accepted Congratulations to the authors. But they, they were complaining that um, because in, in virtual reality you don't have a, a good binocular perception, uh, basically any type of visual motor coordination that you can demo there it does, is not transferable to reality. So that was kind of a, a very interesting premise. And I think you know, that will be solved over time, and I think Sarah can talk a bit more about you know how she's seen the distance estimation has changed with new devices, uh, but um, you know I, I think it's it, it's an evolving field, so we will see a lot of that, of devices getting better, which I'm very glad to see. Mm -hmm. But maybe Sarah can well, comment more. I would more. say like you know it's hard for me to say that like the last 15 years of work that I did is like should be down the drain right now that these these new technologies came out. Like I think there's still some worth in it in the sense that we've also argued that um, that studying studying how this distance compression or like kind of um, these effects in virtual environments can kind of help us in understanding the basic perceptual me mechanisms, the basic information that's used in the real world even. So for example, we can look at avatars, right? So we found that once we started putting avatars in the virtual environment, even in the old HMDs and the Envis, we would get more accurate distance judgments. So people, so we can say that then people use their visual body to scale that space, right? So we could think of examples where we were trying to chase down the applied problem, but in fact that helped us understand what information people are using in the real world to judge, judge space. So I would say, but then it also um, is a good question to say like, you know, are we gonna just be chasing the technology? Should we, should we make a big deal about like the 10% distance compression that we see in the Oculus or the Vive? Because now, you know, the next generation that comes out, maybe we, we won't even see that. Maybe it will be, the, the issue solved in, with uh, binocular yeah. disparity. I, th like I think it's even more like, um, uh, imagine you're driving, you're driving in continental Europe, you drive on the right side, you go to the UK, you drive on the left side, and you can have both modalities mm -hmm. and assume both modalities, or even if you are a speaker of multiple languages, you're able to compartmentalize. So I, I guess you could learn that in virtual reality, this is how perception works, and this is how perception works outside virtual reality, and then just have the mapping. I have a slightly different answer than Sarah's, and I've worked in this field as well. But I, I think it's I think that it's important because it's science and it's evolving knowledge. And I think to fixate on the specific devices too much is to miss the broader point. When I got into the when I got into this work 15 years ago, let's say, I mean, people were concentrating on is it accommodation vergence mismatch that was causing distance compression? And I think the answer to that is no. Is it the weight of the HMD that's causing it? I think the answer to that is yes. What does that tell us? We need lighter HMDs. Is it the field of view of the HMD that's causing it? The answer to that is, I think, yes. We need wider field of view HMDs. Um, is it other factors that are causing it? The answer to that is still yes. It, limited field of view and, and the weight of the H and D don't account for all of it. So I think that, but 
but you know, we narrow, we eliminate some factors. You you check off the marks for other factors. It tells you how to design better HMDs. So I think that's what you have to focus on, and not the specifics of well, the DK2 is better than the Invis SX60, which is worse than something else, and, and so on and so okay. forth. So that's, I think, the way I look at it, at least. Uh, I, I would okay. say. Okay, uh, let's move to the next question, and I'll ask uh, the okay. rest. Uh, so I, I think Joel was then, and, and then we'll have Andy Van Damme. Hi, uh, Joel Collin from MSR. Uh, actually, it's a kind of a follow-on question to the last topic. Great. Um, do you think that there's anything um, that this, uh, especially in VR, because I agree with you with AR, it's just the, the field of view is so narrow, it's almost worthless for, to study at this point. But if VR, um, do you think that there's any correlation between this effect and perhaps lack of calibration for the, or lack of accurate calibration for the user-specific interocular distance and how that might also play with the, the design of the uh, HMD? Yes, Sarah and Bobby. Well, I mean, we're, we've actually been interested in, in that question very recently because um, we've been we started to test children in the HTC Vive, and the Vive um, IPD only goes down to like 61 millimeters, and a child's IPD is going to be like 50 or less, maybe even. So we've started so. Subjectively, we've run a bunch of children in VR and have had no one complain that that the images looked blurry or that that they couldn't see depth or something like this. But at the same time, we haven't objectively measured is their distance perception um, uh, biased in, in some way, especially for near distances. So we're starting to look at that. We're starting to measure more specifically our the range of IPDs that we have and see if we can see if the mismatch predicts. Um, distant judgments, but um, so so there's some possibility. We did some work years ago where we um, did a controlled study where we set the IPD to so they're measured. We measured the participants' IPD, or we just used a standard um, value, or we even had no. We had biocular vision, the same image to both eyes, and we found no difference in the distance compression using the Envis. You know, probably ten years ago. But That's really interesting. That yeah, you didn't yeah. see any difference. Okay. Yeah, so it's hard so to know. Do you think that's because uh, we get the depth through a parallax rather than? Yeah, I think part of it is these distances are outside of the you know close space where um, b where binocular disparity should matter, right? So we're looking at distances that are three, four, five, eight meters away, and so one oh, okay. thing that we want to look at in this new IPD study is like really looking at within a meter or two um, distances compared to farther distances and uh, maybe we'd okay. see Okay, so you did the IPD study, but only for things that are pretty far away, not the stepping over type. That's right, we okay. didn't. Yeah. We did it for distance judgments that were like starting at about three or four meters. Yeah. Okay, uh, Andy, please. So many questions. I'll just select a few. Uh -huh. So have you tried doing these various uh, measurements with a faked field of view in the real world. No headgear, but limited field of view through some kind of little cardboard cutout. Yeah. And compared that against what the head mount gives you. What do you find? We, yeah. People are accurate in the real world yeah. until you get really, really Really small. Really narrow. Much smaller than they Much smaller than you would even think. So, so that would say that field of view isn't all that important. That's that what there's people, something else that's going what, on. So Bobby and I disagree, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what that was my paper that we yeah. did that's yeah. just through field of view. And then Bobby just did a very extensive study with the Vive, Oculus, uh, Envis. Invis, right? yeah. And found in VR that the field of view mattered. But in yeah. the real, we found in the real world, we restricted field of view. And as long as we let people rotate their heads, they were accurate. If we, we, had, a, we had one condition where we had a neck brace on, and they couldn't rotate their head, and they showed distance compression. So, but in, the, in VR, you can always rotate your head, right? Mm -hmm. so, so we had claimed it wasn't field of view at that time. You know, the, right. the new VR, the new consumer level HMDs seem to be showing something a little bit different. So second question, there seems to be a variation with the, the age of the equipment. 
Uh, is there any prediction possible based on going back 10 years and moving forward in the tech to see what we could expect next? Will the gap just narrow asymptotically? It's a good question. It could, I mean, it could be that we're the best we could be right now, right? Like with the, with the Oculus or the Vive. Let's hope we're getting better, no? Mm -hmm. yeah, let's hope we're, it's getting better. Um, and then I think AR devices have a ways to go, right? That, right. that uh, so would hope for some improvement. All right, and then okay. last question. Oh, Randy Pausch. Andy, Andy, we have more people. Right. The last one, okay, you, you can do another one. Just the last one. <laughs> Randy Pausch started a lot of this work many years ago by looking at slope measurements. I noticed none of you did that, and that seemed to have a big difference between what you experienced in VR and the real world. Have any of you looked at slope measurements? I haven't. Like slant of, of, of hills, you mean? Yeah. Um, Measuring inclination. Yeah. Some. I haven't directly either, but some some have, you know, and I think that there's some distortions, uh, but not with the new HMDs, though. So that would be um, an interesting question to look at. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Words? Okay. Um, yeah. Please. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacob Chakareski. I'm with the University of Alabama. And first of all, I would like to start by thanking the, the panel for the very interesting discussions. I really enjoyed it, and I'm happy to be part of this session. Now, uh, I'm very passionate about augmented and virtual reality. It's, it's our two topics that I think that I mean, the technologies can be transformative and make a real big impact on our society. And I've been working on them for the past almost two years. And uh, I have a remark that I would like to ask the, co the panel to comment upon, and so I would like to share it with you first. So. In the late summer of 2017, maybe the fall 2017, I had, I, my background is in communication systems, uh, uh, coding of data, how data is delivered over networks. So I had these striking observations. I mean, these technologies are very exciting. And the impact could be truly achieved if we can deploy them with actual content representing a remote scene in a wireless manner uh, where the data is in one location and the user is somewhere else. But then, you know, I made the observation, you know, that our network systems as of today, and even those network systems for the future would not be able to support the required data rates and latencies that we would need to deliver this data to a remote user. For instance, in a remote setting, like a setting, a uh, slide showed like where a firefighter may want to go to a remote site to, ex to examine it remotely and so forth. And so to make sure that I was not going nuts, I intended most of the, uh, uh, events or venues in this in si the systems area, such as Infocom, SIGCOM, and I talked to other researchers about this apparent bottleneck that you know we have even more bigger challenges ahead of us to solve to to enable this potential. And there was an agreement in a in a in a growing community that there are many interesting technical aspects to be solved there. And so the comments that we have observed so far and all these challenges that were sh shared in the panel they're very interesting and you know understandably. Most of the work that in this area has come so far from the computer vision and usability studies and so forth where all these challenges are, uh, appear. But there are even bigger challenges ahead, as I said, because I'll give one example. If you want to send an Okay, um, just cutting a little bit. So I understand your question is yes. about how we scale networks to right. provide this exactly. type of remote applications. Exactly. I think uh, maybe Henry is a good can person. I just, like, complete my um, can I just complete my thought? So yes. solving this challenge would require integration of emerging technologies in a way that has not been done before. Because just expecting the next generation of 5G networks to solve this alone would not do it. So there is a need for several technologies, such as edge computing, uh, sending data using visible light or millimeter wave, and more efficient ways of representing the data to be integrated in an end-to-end -end manner to resolve this question okay. or challenge. That was my point. OK, good. Uh, thank you. Um, Ayal or Henry, uh, if you want to answer regarding how you see uh, you know, content distribution or? Right, there's certainly lots of technologies that we're going to need much more than we have right now. Mm -hmm. And the content transmission, I think, is one that we haven't faced yet. And I think that's because the other 
more primitive technologies are not good enough yet. So even if somebody solved, if somebody magically gave us mm -hmm. uh, 100 gigabits per second to my home, I couldn't use it because the rest of the ecosystem is not there yet. So I think that as a worldwide community, we're solving the various problems as they come up. I agree with you that communication is a lot, is mm -hmm. a lot. We could, but I, th I think that what you identified, for yeah. example, field of view, I think is the biggest problem in AR today. And Joel, if you could only solve it for us. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's doing it already. Right. And OK, wait a second. You need a microphone because um, this is being recorded. But you have to make it yeah, like it. super short because. <laughs> I just quote a figure, you know. So the, some of the uh, numbers are really like striking. So if you want to serve multiple users, the rates that you need to, s to use, I mean, your network to support, go beyond 10 of terabytes per second per square meter. Well, I think that, that depends on how much data you want to transfer, because we have been yeah. using Photon Server for a uh, local multiplayer in VR, oh. and you know okay. it works pretty well. And and I think um, th these things will scale. We'll I, I agree with uh, Henry. You can also look at other factors such as the dependency between what multiple users see oh, and, and dependency on location and things like that that you can use to really lower exactly, uh, transmission. Exactly. That's why so I said like it needs unique yeah. integration. Of yeah. Okay, uh, that's all for today. And thank you very much everyone for coming. I also want to highlight that uh, Victoria Interrante, who's also an expert on distance compression, is here. So if you have more questions, maybe she's talk about the slopes or other questions that you had. So um, regarding fidelity, and thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.